welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew and I'm super pumped to be introducing this brand new series we're about to kick off all around the three P's of plan produce profit. Now, the XY team has spent a lot of time thinking about what makes a great financial advice offering, a great financial advice business. And what we distilled it down to was that there are three key elements that you need to get right to have any level of success in your financial planning business. The first is about planning and how to plan an epic service proposition that's engaging for the people that you want to work with and compelling to drive real results within your business. The second is about producing and that's about being efficient in your business, streamlining things, maximizing benefits of technology to uh, run a a scalable and uh, profitable advice service. And then the third is profit, which is all about getting your message out to a bigger market. How do you attract more people into this awesome offer that you're running efficiently and scalably? So I'm taking over over the next 15 episodes. We're going to have 15 advisors. It's going to be 100% advisors. I've had a bunch of fun with the recordings that I've done so far, the interviews, and, uh, and I've got a few more great ones to come. So I hope you enjoy this series. This episode is proudly sponsored by FE Analytics. Now, a number of XY advisors have already discovered this one-stop, easy-to-use tool that helps with investment research, analysis, portfolio construction, ongoing monitoring, and client reporting. Find out how FE Analytics can help you improve your business process, manage your existing client base, and win new business by contacting Bruce Jenner via bruce.jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R, at financialexpress.net or visit financialexpress.net for more information. Mr. Holmes, Dino, Dean, the Deanster. Whatever, whatever you want. Ooh. Dino is the most common one. We add, you know, it's the Australian culture. We just add an O to Daddy. the end of it. Daddy-o. Well, we're both, we're both dads Daddy-o. now. Daddy-o. Yeah. No, that's, so, that's it's a new, new world. You're, you're two weeks into it. I'm eight months into it. The new, it's the new black baby. Is the new black? Oh, it's very popular. Or the new um, Asian. Wait till you stop people in the street and start to interview them about prams. So oh, yeah, I'm enjoying that. Fashion. Yeah, I saw a guy in the cafe, and I was like, "Excuse me, mate, can you tell me about this pram? Does it fold up? Do you put it in the car? Just things that I didn't need to know. I didn't think that I needed to know in my life. I now have this extra piece of you information. Still, you still went with the, the knockoff of my pram." Is that right? Well, we bought the pram. We bought a different pram uh, and it broke. So we bought a, um, a, a hashtag, shall I ben- mention the proper brand? But we bought a reasonably expensive branded pram, which wasn't the bugaboo one. But then it broke and it was a recall and they were thing. And we just didn't really like the pram. We thought it was too big and chunky and stuff like that. So we returned it and got our money back. And at the same time, we were going to Boston. And so we needed a travel pram. Oh, yeah. And so we needed it quickly, and you could buy the Chinese knockoff of the um, Yo Yo one or Baby Zenyo or whatever it is for for a hundred bucks on eBay, and it came the next day. And does it fit on the carry on? Does it go? Yeah, it fits on carry on. So we took it. We took it on the plane, um, even like from LA from San Fran to Boston. You just put it in the overhead compartment. Yeah. Or they let you. They just put it downstairs, and you use it in the airport and stuff. So it's pretty good. Well, I thought I was a pram pro until because it's been going pretty good. It's like one hand thing. You can, yeah. you can open the pram, you can close the yeah. pram. But yesterday I was in the car park and there was a guy who came there waiting for my park. Oh, okay. Oh my God, I cracked under mm. pressure. I was there and I'm bringing around this thing. Fuck it, what's going yeah. on? I got it in the end, but it was, it was, yeah. it was a very stressful experience. Yeah, wait till. Uh, Margot's also like losing her shit crying at the same yes. time. So I had one of those experiences where I said to a chica, I was like, it's fine. I'll take her to this event and we'll just hang out and then we'll come home. Oh, yeah. Like, And she's like, good luck. Yeah. And so <laughs> I went, like I went and everything was going fine until we started needing to walk back to the car. She just wouldn't sleep. And so she's lost, like Florence lost it as they do. And so then I've got to, feed her, put her in the car, put the pram and everything in the boot and then get in the car and drive home and she's just losing it. And 
that was pretty hard. So, so it was it too small? Was that one? No, I I tried the bottle. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's well, a, it's a well, learning process. We're going so well talking about yeah. kids and maybe we should just. Uh, we're, we're, we're having a new about, yeah uh, a new podcast about how to be dads. There's a guy. There's a New Zealand guy um, that does this. Like he does all the practical stuff about how to be a dad right. from a from a Aussie slash Kiwi bloke's perspective. So I'm sure okay. sure we can just maybe put the link. Year, maybe yeah, the- <laughs> Here, we can, we'll do that. Uh, we'll do the pram, pram, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's all right. We, I, if you didn't want to watch this, you could just fast forward the first three minutes of the podcast. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> so, mate, we're talking here uh, all for, for this plan, produce profit series. Today, we're talking about produce, which is all about uh, creating a scalable and efficient service proposition um, where you're, yeah, we're running things scalably efficient. Um, and, and all, all the things that sit underneath that. So, uh, but before I get into the questions around the efficiency side of things, just for, for anyone that doesn't doesn't know the, the uh, man machine that is Dean Holmes, tell me. So your business, Absolute Wealth Advisor, you've been going for. 11, 11 years, yeah. Well, I invited you to our 10 year party, and that was last year. So yeah. we've been running for 11 years uh, in, in June. Right. And uh, how many advisors? In Absolute Wealth Advisors, we've got four um, ARs now. How many clients? Probably about 120. And there's a tail, though, is there as well? There's a tail that's um, getting smaller and smaller every year. So. Oh, what do you guys do? 120 clients, four advisors. Holy shit. That's why you got so much time hanging out on podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> No, we have a high touch. We have a high touch service offering. Paul Paul has thirty clients, and he's getting that down to twenty over the next five years. So that that gives us an idea of the the scale of different clients that we have. I suppose. Right. Well, given we're just across the road, feel free. You know, those ten clients just so you can I'll give you a couple of business cards on the way out. Yeah. There's all there's a it's a whole business coaching thing. If you if you deleted your bottom even 10% of your clients by number every single year and just put on your ideal clients every year, in five years, you've actually turned over 50% of your client book with your ideal clients. And if you just did, if you did that discipline, yes, you're going to lose some revenue, but you're replacing it with revenue that you actually want versus maybe not your ideal clients that are at the bottom. And in five years' time, you've changed your business completely. Absolutely, and I think that that ties very much into the efficiency piece as well, where you're working with all of the the ideal clients, mm. and it allows you to make sure that you're, you know, well, it allows you to drive those efficiencies in the business. Yeah, well. so exactly. No doubt, we'll, we'll chat a bit more about that. But uh, tell me, what is the what's your service offering? What's an ideal client, and what are you doing for them? Yeah, so an ideal client for us, in terms of their categories, they we call them engaged delegators. Okay, so the engaged part is they're actually they're active participants in the financial planning process, which we'll get onto what we do, but they're engaged. So they, they reply to emails, they attend meetings, and they do what we tell them to do. So that's the engagement part. And so everyone's got clients that are super engaged and clients that are kind of you keep dragging them along, and they're the ones that we like to work least with. Uh, and then the delegators part is if you think about it, that we, if we present a strategy, they hear it, they read their statement of advice, and they say yes or no, and then let us do the delegation. They delegate the responsibility to, to us to yeah. implement the plan. So it's not, we don't, we don't work with the, if you think about the alternative of someone's micromanaging or they're saying, well, I'll do that bit and you can do that bit. And when that happens, nothing gets done. So we take the responsibility of the implementation of the plan relatively seriously, which I know that every advisor does, but it's important from the client's perspective that they go, okay, the guys are going to implement yeah. the plan. And especially with your clients, because the, the typical client is a fairly a more complex one than most. Yeah, correct. Like yeah. Business owners. yeah, so uh, business so owners, executives. Entity. Tax planning, correct. I think uh, Paul Barrett continues to astound me with that. You astound yourself, but you even more than you with the, the the level of tax planning knowledge and uh, and different pieces around some of those uh, the entity. Yeah, I think we have a have a 
higher degree of understanding in terms of business structures. I think any advisor that's a business owner starts to learn them by default because you're involved in doing your taxes and we bought and sold businesses, financial planning businesses, our clients have bought and sold businesses. So we get immersed in the process along the way in that we learn about the capital gains tax exemptions. We learn about how best um, businesses should structure themselves to protect key assets of a, of a company like intellectual property or cash uh, versus keeping their risky assets in other entities. Um, so we learnt all that and that's a part of the process. And so we, we don't necessarily give that advice, but we project manage that in conjunction with the accountants and lawyers to make sure the client's getting the right outcome. For sure. And I uh, should have asked you if I could ask you this one before, but revenue band? Um, revenue band is about 1.5. Cool. Cool. So uh, I've got, got a bunch of questions around efficiency, but tell me, j- just give us a bit of the background in terms of the journey with your business clip. So you're running, you know, four advisors now, working with these business owners, got a mm. complex clients, uh, 10, uh, almost 11 years in. Tell us about the, the journey and how you ended up where you are. Right? Yeah, well, the journey, I suppose, say the first couple of years of getting getting started. So Paul and I uh, left a firm together to start start the business um, we left during the GFC, so 2009, we thought that that's a really good time to start a financial planning business, yeah. uh, or 2008, given it's 11 years. We decided to leave at that particular point in time, start our own business. The way we got started is we essentially um, partnered with a kind of like retiring advisor to buy his business out over a period of, t- period of time. So we knew up front that we had our own business that clients were coming to, but we had this business that we were acquiring at the same time over over sort of a three-year period. Um, So that was quite good. That lowered our risk, obviously, in terms of paying wages. Um, I was was young and single at the time, um, soon not to be single, but young and single when we made the decision. And so my expenses were quite low, but Paul was was 12 years older than me, so he was in the private school high expense period. And so it was hard for us to go out as, as, as sort of you did and others did of, of start businesses from absolute scratch because we needed a bit of cash flow yeah. um, in, in, the, in the business. Um, and we had a couple of false starts in the, in the beginning years. Like we made a decision uh, where we were licensed by the AFSL of the business that we were partnering with. Um, and sort of six less than six months into that relationship, the AFSL came and saw us and said that they were shutting down the AFSL. Right. Um, essentially, if you go all the way back then, there was some um, within their group that had some advisors that probably weren't doing the greatest, greatest thing. There was a lot of failed products in the GFC, and so I believe they saw the writing on the wall and decided to close their AFSL before the flood of complaints and claims may have hit. Um, so a lot of things to do and then we had to find a new licensee, uh, you know, at, at the six month mark, not dissimilar to other advisors that are running around now trying to find, um, licensees because licensees are, go, seem to be either culling advisors with yeah. AMP or, or just shutting up shop as well. So it's a challenging time for that now, now as well. The challenge, the result for us is that we knew of another, another AFSL, which is Fitzpatrick's that Paul, going back a long, has a long history with the founders of of Fitzpatrick, Scott Fitzpatrick. Um, And so it was like a safe home for us to go to where we trusted the people um, much more than anything else. So we knew that 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 would be a reasonable way for sell, but we, you you know, you pick the people, not necessarily anything else. And so we chose the people and and we were licensed by them for about uh, three years. Okay. It's, and essentially, we made the decision three years later that we would go and get our own, uh, set up our own AFSL. Yeah. Um, and so, a little bit, little bit differences in the journey of what we did over the over the years. It's interesting is that we bought and sold um, financial planning businesses. So we, Paul and I, bought um, some of the some Fitzpatrick's financial planning businesses that were based in Sydney. Yeah. Um, that that is about seven six years ago now. So we bought two financial planning firms that had advisors in them uh, and we owned them for three years. Then we essentially sold those businesses to the advisors that were, that were running them. Um, That taught us a lot about Mm. the differences between having owning a business that is a financial planning business and having salaried advisors versus having 
um, owning a financial planning business and you are the advisor or um, the advisor also owns part of the business. So what I, the reading between those lines, I'm saying that it's having employed salaried advisors as a business owner is quite hard and quite risky um, just in the context that the client owns the client, this whole client relationship is with this advisor that you're paying a salary, but if him or her go across the street and work for another advice business, some of those clients may gravitate across there. Yeah. Um, and so that's a risk that personally me and my family don't want to take on, as in I borrow, I borrow money to buy a business that then the clients leave. So I decided that we didn't want to do that and so we sold the businesses and that closed that kind of chapter of our journey. Uh, but, hey, we, we learned a hell of a lot along the way. We had, that was, we had 15 staff, I think, at the top uh, across, the two, across the two businesses and so it was a lot more, a lot more to ma- manage as a result of that. And given that you're no longer um, buying up businesses with advisors and putting on advisors in your business, does that mean that you feel the you, employed salaried advisor is a, is a better model for growth where you're looking to grow? No, no, no. What? No, we, no, we don't think that that's a – I wouldn't employ an advisor to work in absolute wealth advisors going forward. I would what – we, what we would prefer to do is if an advisor wants to – uh, start a advisor wants to start a business, or we want to give an advisor clients. Eventually, we will put that book of clients into a new entity, and that under their business, and we would have a co ownership arrangement with with them. Because when there's a co ownership relationship, the the financial incentives are known and documented because we're shareholders, yeah. and you can't steal from your own company, so you can't go across the road and take the clients out of your own company and, and move along. So yep. it's sort of just, it removes that risk from, from the business. Yep. Cool. And so thinking on, on the efficiency side, mm. so I know you're an efficient human being. Um, in fact, you watch your movies at 1.25 mm. speed. Um, I do. Just to, just to get through them yep. a little quicker. You can't, more. unfortunately, I can't do it anymore because Netflix doesn't allow you to do that but back in the day when you were able to um download a legitimate backup copy of a movie that you had at home um you could then watch that movie at 1.2 times the the normal rate and hands down you don't know any difference yeah so exactly. and how quickly you're getting through movies. how quickly you're getting through movies exactly how many movies you can watch so when i was flying back and forth from london I, I could actually squeeze in like two extra movies by watching them on my laptop compared to the screen. So, there you go. Shit, I, so uh, I can't believe you remembered that, but that's a, that's a good example of my randomness of efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, and that's uh, actually, that takes me back the, uh, the London days back in uh, about four years ago, five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago. Back yeah. in the, the uh, inaugural XY Modern Advisor Conference. We, uh, oh yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Satellite and yeah, it works, it works quite well. I was wearing my business shirt and shorts, I think, at that time. Uh, but, yeah, that's been another adventure that, that I had in my journey. And my wife and Chica uh, amazingly got a transfer. Not, ama- not amazingly, but she works she very hard. She is amazing and she got a transfer um, across to the London office of Unilever, which is the, head, the global headquarters. And so we were able to live, live and work over there for two and a half years uh, I commuted back to Sydney to have met client meetings and to see the team um, and mentoring meetings and all of that. And I worked, I worked remotely the rest of the time. And so I did an XY thing and, and spoke to clients, engaged clients and worked with them remotely. And it worked, it worked reasonably well. The time zones uh, weren't great in terms of times that I had to get up in order to talk to people uh, in Australia. But say if you wanted to live in Tasmania and work remotely, the time zones would be perfect for Sydney. <laughs> and so do you think that, that doing that was part – I know you obviously you were on the efficiency bandwagon before that, but did the, did the move to London and working remotely, do you think that that created more efficiency? I think that's when you brought in your calendar links and stuff as well. Yeah, we started to toy with different efficiencies at that time. We actually – we got in more inefficient when I first left because we used to work in pods 
an advisor and associate advisor. So I had someone working directly with me, pardon me, which allowed me to delegate work directly to one person and then they were responsible for doing lots of the work. And so when I left, we didn't, we sort of changed the structure a little bit to a pooled structure. So the resources that were the associates that we had were working with different advisors and that actually imploded that it wasn't the <laughs> wasn't the right thing to do but it was a function of me le- me leaving um and so that was a learning for us i suppose that our structure works better with having a delegate underneath the advisor in order to have start to build this strong one-on-one relationship for the for delivering to the client um so yeah first we, yeah we've had that fault first false start in terms of structuring it and then we moved back towards having um an associate um, underneath or a virtual assistant a bit more to where we're doing it now, but having someone directly underneath you so that you build that rapport and relationship for everything that's going on. Cool. And so tell me, when you started on the, clearly you've got a natural tendency towards efficiency and, and no doubt it's been in your business for, uh, you know, for, for, for probably since pretty much the get-go. But when you think about the, your journey with efficiency, how did you guys decide you know, where to start. I know that you've toyed with a few different things around teams, which you mentioned, new pods, you know, outsourcing parts, um, uh, now offshoring a, a bit as well. How do you pick, maybe that's more at the later stage, but mm. now how do you pick the priorities and, and what to focus on, how to get started with efficiency? Look, for us, um, we had a, the best, I suppose, over the whole journey, we've been efficient and then we've forgotten how to be efficient and change the way we did it and then looked back on our documents that we did seven years ago and we've looked back and went, we did it better back then. So we're constantly evolving, but sometimes we evolve and then realise actually we were doing it better uh, before. So it's that whole identify what it is and then sh- and then test it and then you still have to look backwards to go, well, is the new way creating efficiencies or is it actually dragging, yeah. dragging efficiencies? Like for us... Uh, in terms of our annual review process, it's it's relatively detailed. Um, the work that the work that goes into it is detailed, but then we're also producing this very large document that went with it every year, which we, we were beginning to realise that clients don't value the document; they just value the answers from the document. And yeah. so we were we've cut down the d- deliverables, but not the value from it. But we've cut down what we what we document because it was just taking too many man hours and no one was valuing it. Um, so that that's sort of the whole thing about we we identify the process that we're going to improve, we try to improve it, but then you've got to test it with clients to see if they valued it or not valued it um, to work out whether you should keep doing it or stop doing it. Yes, it's true. I was talking um, to Brett the other day about he came up with a mailbox business where because he's working with all these expat clients mm, and, mm. Uh, that he would collect mail, securely scan it in, and, and send it to people. But the market told him that that was not a good idea. And mm. it's like that you've got to you've got to look. I think that's one of the things for efficiency is great, but at the end of the day, the client is the is the customer, and uh, they're the ones who get to decide what's going mm. on. Right. And look, I had I tried the calendar booking link, and I sent it out to a few clients, and I said, "Hey, I'm trialing this." Afterwards, I said, "How did you think of it? What did you think of it?" And a couple of them came back and said, what's well, a bit impersonal? Mm-hmm. And I was like, but I'm trying to be more efficient. I hate this. When are you free? When are you free? Yeah. Stuff that goes along. And that was their feedback. So we still we still use it most of the time, the electronic means, um, but we do it differently now that we offer some times and then we say, if these don't work, click on this link and choose a different time. But... Um, the, the reality of what we did first is like we shut that down their throat and some people some people didn't like it. Yeah. I think, yeah, I like that. I like that as an idea, actually. I think I can use that. Too. You can. <laughs> it's definitely not my idea. Some listener is listening right now going, I do that too. Dean stole it from me. Most I, most ideas are not uh, unique. It's just how you integrate them in your business. So. That's it. Yeah. Cool. And so, so, so you, okay, so you work through a whole bunch of different things, but... What do you think is the is one of the key learnings that you that you found through like when you think about trying to try and you know push efficiencies into your advice business? Mm, sorry, one of the key, the key, the key yeah. Um, 
I suppose for for us, we have to we have four advisors now in the business, and so we came up with this concept um, called the Away Way. So AWA for Absolute Wealth Advisors Way. Um, way doesn't have an acronym; it's just a way of doing things. And so what we realized, Away Way. I, I'm, I may pronounce it. We call it the away way, just for everyone to know, um, regardless of how it sounds. Uh, but the context, the context behind that is actually what we found when building processes for our business, we realized that there's quirks within each of us. So Paul Dean and Stella predominantly have been there the, all of the time. We do things slightly different. And what we were realizing is that the slight differences in the way in which we wanted to do things ruined our ability to pr- create a process because what would happen is like we would decide, we would decide on a process and then we would, Paul, for example, is, he was the classic and probably won't listen to this, so it's okay. <laughs> we would be working on the process, but Paul would get three quarters of the way through the process and then deviate because he would realize that, the process doesn't act, didn't completely do what he wanted it to do. So then he would deviate off the process, the glitch in the matrix, a create a spreadsheet, well done, and then he would continue on with the process. And so what, what happened then is that that is not scalable in the, in the context of the advice business because now Paul and his assistant are glit going off on this tangent and I'm going off on this tangent and Stella's trying to follow a process as well, but she doesn't know who to follow so our biggest learning is to absolutely lock down between whoever's in your business what the process is going to be and then give each other permission to go, well, no, you ha- if you don't follow the away way, you have to reinvent the away way. You have to convince me why the deviation is now the new way. Mm-hmm. And we have this, and this has worked really well probably for the last 12 months is that um, well, probably the last two years, actually, that we actually spend more time debating the right way that we want to do something as a business and then we suck it up and do it. Mm-hmm. You know, we agree to disagree, but we agree that we've got the away way and, and then that's it yep. until we come back again to review those processes. And so does that mean that everybody's a little bit pissed off at the end? If everyone, yeah, it's like any negotiation, right? It's like if everyone's a little annoyed at the end of the negotiation, it's been a good negotiation because there's been compromises on both sides. Both people have got a little bit what they want, but not everything. Yeah. You know, that's sort of the way we find the, the middle the middle way between it. Um, I get a bit headstrong sometimes and I go, no, we've got to do it this way. Um, but if Paul does listen, he, he does definitely... Um, believe in the away way now, <laughs> and he does. <died. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I just let him listen to this <laughs> ten minute section. <laughs> yeah, and so you, so you tried a few different iterations of team, and I think mm. for me, what I found, and, and I, you know, I've mentioned a few times on the podcast about for the first three years of, of Pivot World, it was my, it was me, the first year me, then the gang as well, my wife, uh, a couple of years. Um, what I learned through that is that team is really the key uh, to, to running a, a, a scale advice, like mm. a, a scalable business where you don't just go fucking insane mm. from uh, from plugging away. Shout out to all the uh, the solo heroes out there, but uh, I think that if you if it, there does become a limit where as you try to run a business, you're trying to be an advisor, you're trying to do something unless you unless you were really just running a pure lifestyle business and you're happy with a small number of clients, it's very difficult, I think, to be, to be sustainable and be really good uh, without going crazy at that level. So to me, team, I think, is, is super important. Mm. You've tried some different things, pods, pulled, um, some, you know, did not worked, outsourcing, we're using the same outsourcing company for a little bit. you changed your approach again now, yeah. now doing some offshoring as well. Um what do, you, what do you think, like, what are your takeaways through that? Or what, what would you say to someone in terms of how do you approach knowing that an iteration is needed in your team or how to, how to figure out what the right approach to those things mm. are within a financial Yeah. Team? So the, the journey that we had, and it happens to everyone, so in terms of we had what we called associate advisors, you might call them 
experienced CSOs moving into junior advisors, associate advisors sort of thing. So we had these people that we would get in with some good university education, some financial planning experience. Shitty accents. She, some of them would have shitty accents. Um, well, but <laughs> both of them had accents if they're both listening, but that's a different story. Um, and then we would train them in in the away way, but we didn't call it that back then, is they would come through the Dean Holmes boot camp of financial planning. So I would spend two years training them up on how to do everything the way that we wanted it to be done. And so, but the evolution of them as people is that we do a really good job, but then at some point in time, we don't necessarily have the ever-growing business to ever-grow positions for them. So CSO to, you know, senior CSO to associate advisor, the next step is to become an advisor. And we didn't quadruple our number of clients to put them as an advisor on their, on their own. And so what we, the iteration of going through that is we had a lot of success until the point at which we were unable to accommodate them in their career context. So they have to go. And we're, we're okay with that, the, you know, but that's... Some more than others. Some more than others, but... <laughs> if he's, <laughs> if he's, if he's, <laughs> shout out, shout out. <laughs> if he's listening, you can contact us. Um, but yeah, like we got to that point and we, we are proud in some context because we built a person that from, you know, not nothing, but from a junior person up into someone that can sit and stand in front of clients. Yep. But that evolution meant that we lost a lot as well. Um, in the context that we lost a lot of intellectual property, client relationships, and just stuff left the business when those people left. And also time, right? As well. We've got to retrain someone from scratch. You are uh, you know, you do all these things and, and uh, you know, it's the, it's the thing, it's the right thing for an, for an employer to do to mm. help you, your team build their skills mm. and all that sort of jazz. But, but also you, you can see that the time that goes into tech training people up and it's quite mm. technical stuff that you guys do uh, as well is, is then it's time that hard to, especially it's on hard. something yeah. so bespoke mm. it's, it's, it's not like you, there's a procedure manual and someone comes in and goes oh, okay mm. I'll, I'll just follow all that follow, yeah. follow the steps so yeah. do you, that's an interesting one so, so do you think then that because what I'm sort of picking up from what you're saying is and I hadn't actually thought about this before but that you've got to have the team strategy that fits your business strategy because you guys were like oh well we're just going, you know, we're happy with our, with our like slow ish growth. Mm. Uh, but you've got a substantial business, obviously, but uh, you're not looking to grow, grow, rap- grow rapidly or grow, in, in, you know, yeah, rapidly. Yeah, we weren't looking to double our size. So we didn't need, or even, you know, an advisor should manage half a million, can easily manage half a million revenue with the right structures. And so that we weren't. We weren't planning to put on half a million dollars worth of revenue in one year to warrant graduating that person. And even when we did that, then we'd need two new CSOs that I'd have to train up. Yeah. So it's sort of the business growth strategy of, of growing the revenue, but then putting more. I've now put three, about three new employees, then two new CSOs and one new advisor. The profitability may not actually be that much more even though my revenue is half a million dollars higher, yeah, which we can do on the on your profitability podcast um, in terms of whether adding extra advisors adds extra profit to profit to the owners. Yeah, that's um, what we're all talking about. This whole thing is all about scalable mm. efficiency, so scalability of your service offering, but then scalability of your business as yeah. well. And yeah, yeah, as a number, but mm. really, it's your, your bottom line is the, is the most important. Yeah, number. so. Uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, like what I'm getting is that you need to think about what's your business growth strategy and then have a team strategy that's consistent because mm. you know if you want to have slow growth but then you've got people and you're getting hungry, motivated people mm. training them up because then they're going to hit the ceiling. They're going to hit the ceiling and, and yeah, want to go. Want to on. Mm. So, uh, so where we are now, um, we had a couple of iterations of where we are now but essentially – we decided that there were some functions in the business that we wanted to uh, remove from the business. Those two, uh, the first one that we wanted to, we decided that we wanted to remove from the business was just a power planning function. Um, so we now partnered with an outsourced 
power planning business to generate our financial planning documents. And so that is that's a scalability thing. Once no, 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 click. Okay, um, Nick Toppen. Um, so that's a, that's a scalability decision as well. Is that actually I now can if I had three clients coming in in two weeks' time, I could get their three SOAs done on time. Yep. Whereas if it was in my business, I if we're doing if we're in our review season and I get three new clients, the documents are going to be delayed just in terms of the capacity that we have within our own business. So that was one of the things that we got out of our business, and we definitely are happier not writing SOAs. I agree. Okay, I think that it's it is a specialist skill set in terms of the knowledge and understanding. We do mo- we still do all of the power planning type thinking, but then we're able to very easily fill out a paramet. We we fill out a power planning request form. We record a video going through all the source documents, talking through all the strategies, talking through what the power planning request form is. So we sort of do a 10, as if that we were talking to our power planner, yeah. we do like a 10-minute brief of what we want the advice document to cover. Oh. Um, and video video is the most amazing thing in our, it's changed our business as well, which we'll get onto. Um, but just the ability to, record and explain what you want to do in the context of getting this SOA requested Mm -hmm. makes our life so much easier. And so that's one function that we got out of the business. And then the other function that we, it's not really out of our business, but we just partnered with a firm to do our, do most of our administration. And so we've had, we had two full, a false start in that regard. The first firm we used was essentially a, um, join a queue type of form. So if I wanted super research done, I would join the queue of people waiting, queue of advisors waiting for super research to be done. And when I got to the front of the queue, the staff member would do my super research and send it back to me. Yeah. Then if I need another one done, I would join the queue and it would wait. And so the queue wasn't necessarily always long, but the two things that happened as a result is it was very hard to get urgent work done because the queue is the queue. Um, And... There was no, because we were joining this queue, the process, we weren't able to use our processes exactly. It was sort of, we were in their process processes and the staff members that were there were following like 10 different processes because yeah. that what I wanted, what the other advisor wanted, what the other advisor wanted, and they're, they're from three different licensees with three different requirements. So that didn't work for us. And this is the whole away way thing is like, it's just we just want one way to do it, not yeah. five ways to do it. And so, what where we move to now is that we have um, their call, the businesses calls them virtual assistants, but essentially they're CSOs that work work in Cebu, yeah, in the Philippines, and um, they're amazing. So the difference that we went with is we have full time staff, so they only work completely for us. Yeah. Um, and we train them. So um, VA Platinum do some introductory training, but then they're, then they're our people. So they only do our work, they follow our processes, they do everything for us, and they're part of our team. Sure. Um, so, and that's that in the last 12 months has changed our business once again, mm-hmm. just in terms of our ability to um, dele- obviously delegate work, but have them diligently following up things that they that were, you know, sometimes falling through the cracks here because you just you you have too many things to do here. Yeah, and so you've been going twelve months. You got two, yeah, four, four now. Yeah, four now. Holy yeah, crap. I agree quickly. Mm. So we have the, if you think per week we have approximately one hundred and sixty hours of processing capacity in Cebu yeah. with the four people. And so uh, the, the volume of work that we're able to get done as a result is high. Mm. And essentially each of our staff members here in Sydney have a staff member directly in Cebu. That's how we work with that, with some crossovers of responsibilities. So each, we're making, like um, Katie, who works in Cebu, she's becoming our insurance specialist in the admin context, not in the advice context. Yeah. So if there's insurance quoting and stuff like that to be done by requested by any advisor, 
Katie will be the subject matter expert of the insurance, for example, and she'll project, she'll make sure the quotes are being done correctly, for example. Um, and uh, CJ is responsible for doing some FDS and engagement agreement work, and so none of the other uh, none of the other team do that, for example. So we've got each of them working on little specialties, as well as providing direct one on one support to the advisor to deliver to their clients. I like it. And so, when, if you're you know working with the working with the team and uh, over the last twelve months, and also from you know a couple of false starts with uh, with the outsourcing mm. people, the, the people that are external parties, what do you what have you learned? Like, what do you, what would you say is that is a, is a key thing that you need to get right to make that actually successful? Because I see a lot of it. I know I'm mm. fail at it twice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that it's it's not it's not easy to to run a team and, and make it work in a way where you think we're engaged and mm, getting good mm. results. And, uh, yeah, so I think there's there's two answers that two answers to the question. The first is the the where the staff are located and the company that you choose. So um, we we use VA VA Platinum. They came very highly rec- recommended. I know about six other advisors that that use the firm. Um, and so they offer great benefits to their employees. So they pay them well. They get a rice allowance, which is important in Cebu. Um, they get um, all the public holidays that they're entitled to. They get um, med- private medical insurance for themselves and one, fam- one family member. Um, and that's important because often families live together in Cebu. So mum mom and dad and kids live in the one household. And so... You can allocate this private health insurance to whoever needs it the most within okay. within your family, which yeah. is which is which is really important. They get breakfast every day provided by the by the company, which yeah. is essentially provided by us, but provided by the company. And all and then they have great culture. They go out on events. You know, our couple of our guys now like catch up on the weekend, or they go out for lunch together and things like that. So they. They're like a team that work for us in and amongst a larger team, which is now 100 staff. Brian has 100 staff there. So he's done a lot of work on building the culture of that office, mm. which then distills down to happy people. Yep. Okay. So we've got happy people working in Cebu is the first and foremost thing. And then how we have integrated with them is we have the philosophy that absolutely the way in which you would have taught someone if they were here in Sydney is you would have sat next to them, explained it, looked at the screen together, and then delegated the work that way. Mm-hmm. And so we did exactly the same thing, except using Microsoft Teams, which is like Slack video sharing. It's nothing, it's just, it's not a fancy piece of software. But what we're able to do very quickly and easily is constantly be in touch with our staff via video. Yep. So if I want them to do something, I can video call them and talk to them and look at them, explain what I want to do, share my screen, and then they're able to do it. Yep. And the bit that they do amazingly well, uh, and this is this is what Brian put into the business, is they always record every conversation. So have you ever had a time when you've spoken to a staff member saying, can you do this, 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 and this, and this? Yeah. And you walk away and they haven't written anything down. Yeah. And you're like, you know, I always yeah, use yeah. my pen and paper. Like, I was like, do that. And then I come back like next week and I'll be like, oh, have you done all that? And they've done two out of five. Yeah. You know, and so that doesn't happen. So you have it, they have a high degree of success because of the tools that they use to make sure that they do the tasks. Yeah. They just watch the video back. And so I've taught Bentley. Bentley's my other guy. Everyone knows Bentley's name. Um, but Bentley does some complicated stuff for me now, but I've taught him once. Yeah. I showed him on the video. He recorded it. The next the next month when he had to do this recording, 10 out of 10. Yeah. Because well, he recorded it. So what we've taken that to now this away way. So we've got a whole knowledge and resources library, which is which is probably about 50% complete. But our goal is to have every process documented, but documented to us means that it's written, there's a template document, and there's videos explaining how to do something. Yeah. We do the same thing. We, we use, um, like, Salesforce CRM. Mm. Every process has its steps and the tasks, and then every task has a link to a video yeah. that, that 
uh, but it's just the screen mm. just talking through yep. like, all of the things as well. Like, mm. I love that in that you should because I think it's easy when you're when you're in this outsourcing or offshoring and you just go, well, there's a form or like, hit a you know Slack message or something. Mm. You go, there you go, do that thing. Mm. Things are getting lost in translation. There's a cultural gap mm. you know, as well. Uh, that it's easy to. Um, yeah, to, to fall into that, and then people aren't engaged. The the, the team's not motivated. You don't mm. get the results yeah. as well. So I like I like that tip around the video. And let me ask you, how much do you think? Because you hired two guys right at the start. How yeah. much of a difference do you think that that makes? It, it makes a, a fundamental difference. Yeah. So it's it's like they learn from one another, and now it's got even better because we have four staff now. Is that we were told to get two. Brian said, don't get one, just get two. And, yeah. you know, that costs us double. Yeah. Um, but absolutely, I would always recommend two staff over one. You've got sick holiday, you've got holidays and sick leave covered. Mm. Not that that has 20 days a year. It's not, it's not significant. It's not huge. But in terms of your ability to teach things, you teach it once and two people have learnt it, which then they can document it. We don't document our processes anymore. They do. Um, and it just means also if it doesn't work out, you can keep one. Yeah. Okay. So two, two could become one because you, because you don't make a right hire, which, can, which didn't happen for us, but it can happen. Yeah. And, but if that does happen, you now have one person who can train the other. Mm-hmm. So, so when CJ started, who was our third, we did cultural onboarding, you know, talk to about our business, what we do, how all the pieces of the pie fit together. Yeah. But in terms of her learning what SharePoint was or what the Colonial First State website was, mm-hmm. she was learning from our knowledge and resources page, but mostly just by talking to the staff member that's right next to her. Yeah. You know, and so we've, we're getting that leverage in terms of other business. We want to encourage the other businesses in the wealth network that they also over time have VAs in the same pod. Mm. So, you know, Jess and Glenn are going to have two VAs in the future and those two VAs are going to learn from ours. So amazingly, you bring on staff into your business and they learn processes from people that are sitting with them. Yeah. That's that's winning in my context of, mm. of virtual assistance. I like it. I like it. You, you're, uh, yeah, you're, I'm renewing my faith. So yeah, um, I think yeah, the, I think that the efficiency in teams is a massive driver of efficiency in a business overall. Um, mm. But so, what do you think if you if you if you take a step back and say if someone's looking at really really doubling down on efficiency in their business, what do you think the key thing to get right is? Look, the the key thing that we've been focused on is sort of to talk through how you structure your annual review process in the context of any anyone that's starting a business, year one is kind of easy because you take on all these clients, do it. Then you get to year two and you've got to deliver to year one clients again yeah. as well as take on all these new year two clients. Yeah. And as you get year three, four, five, and six, it's just going to keep multiplying. And, and so the annual review process is really important. It's what clients value the, the most. And, you know, Hayne said that that's the bit that, you know, they should be paying for and that's what they value the most in terms of the yes. review document, the ROA, et cetera, et cetera, not your, not your newsletter. Um, I don't read your newsletter, by the way, but that's okay. I don't have a newsletter. Good. Clients don't value it. <laughs> <laughs> we once, as a side story, we, we used to do a, like an investment newsletter. This is back in 2009 or 10, right? Yeah. So we, Paul and I would spend this time writing this investment newsletter you know, what's good value, what's buy, sell, hold, not stocks, but just equity asset valuations and stuff like that. And we sent it out to all of our clients to Reddit. Yeah. We tracked it to Reddit. We would have been better off spending that time ringing those two clients to say, this is the situation and letting the other 99 clients go. Yeah. And we learned it on the the negative side as well. Uh, As one client ran us up and said, you should have, why didn't you recommend that I buy some more? And we're like, we sent this newsletter every quarter for the last year saying it's time to buy since 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're like, oh, I haven't read that. I thought you would have called me. Yeah. And so we're like, oh, okay, we learned from that. Um, but anyway, so we don't, we don't send the newsletters either. Um, 
But in terms of our review process, we, we be, we've become quite structured in the way in which we, we deliver reviews and in order in the way in which we divide our, our year in terms of delivering the re- annual reviews. So we, divide, we only deliver annual reviews in February, March, April, May, so the first four, those four months in the first half of the year, and then we do August, September, October, November. They're the only times that we deliver annual reviews to clients. And then June is always tax planning. So we're not selling agribusiness or anything like that, but tax planning for us is making sure clients and business owners have made their super contributions, made their pension withdrawals. We take all of our clients that are business owners to their accountant to do all their tax planning for their businesses to make sure what the dividends and profits going to be. So that's the month of July, sorry, June for us. Um, July, which we just finished, is a little bit of a rest. Um, we usually finish our projects that we're working on and just just mutter through July, which is quite nice. Um, August, September, October, we'll we'll do annual reviews, and then December and January is projects and Christmas parties and and rest as well. Um, not that we rest in all those periods; it doesn't sound right, but um, we take the we pause during those periods in terms of doing the reviews. Um, and what that's done is actually allow, allows us to focus really hard on when we're doing the reviews. Um, and then we've built a relatively good process in terms of everything that we've got to do for any client annual review that's coming in. So, and what do you do if the client needs a review and it's in, in June or July? Like if something big is going on, what do you do? Look, we, of course we meet our clients. We yeah. wouldn't, like there's a difference between doing our annual review for them yeah. and solving a problem for them. So clients ring us all the time with with stuff. They go, oh, I'm thinking about doing this or I need to do this. That's incremental advice that we provide all of the time. Yeah. Um, but we, we provide them their formal documented annual review in those months. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think scheduling is one of the keys to both on a macro and micro level mm. through, the, through the year is one of the keys to efficiency. I know that for me it's one of the only ways that I can manage my the, the workload between mm. business, working with clients, getting, you know, doing the right number of the right type of meetings to get the right business outcomes mm. as yep. well. Uh, that, and I, you know, I just had this conversation with Ray the other day. We're building out the ideal week and saying these days there's a slot, you know, keep that slot for that strategy meeting yeah. because that's the only way you can hit the, the targets mm. that you want. So yep. uh, I, I think that sometimes when people think about efficiencies, it's all, they think that it's about uh, trying to, uh, you know, it will increase the tech stack or do yeah. something else, but uh, yeah, we're, yeah. yeah, that's right. We're like the opposite from a tech stack perspective. Like we, everything that we try to do, we do within this Office three six five bundle, so we don't, so we don't have leakage. So we have Advisor Logic and three six five, and that's it in terms of tech. Um, well, bold, it works. It works for us, and you know, we can have it. We should have a tech. Um, tech podcast um but from from my perspective it works really well and it's safe and secure um but we always we always have this thing about we don't want to open that win that window up for anything else don't break don't break the cycle it works i like it well i sort of like it except for the fact that i hate myself yeah that's okay um but yeah, I, I agree that the the linking is is something that's that's insanely valuable mm. uh, and the, uh, the benefit that you get from that so sort of that way that some things are better than others. Yeah, mm. like me, but I think it's, it's all the what works for you. Yeah, and it's all the bigger. Yeah, you're right. The 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 time that we save in structuring the annual reviews is significant versus do I need to use Zopia to connect two apps together so that my when a client changes their email address, it syncs across three systems. Yeah. I love that. That's great, but that might save you three seconds. A month, a month, like how many yeah. times does do clients change email addresses, let alone you know street addresses? Whereas structuring your annual review can save you hours per client per year. Yeah. And so, if we improve the process by one of my hours across the hundred clients, yeah. we've saved a hundred hours a year. I can reinvest that into changing clients' email addresses if they <laughs> if they need to. Like. I but I, Maybe not. No, but there's there's that sort of the whole thing about why people are, yeah. you know, they're connecting things so that information is shared amongst all those platforms, yeah. and that's that's great. Um, but don't spend too much time. Yeah, for sure. 
What would you say is the biggest um, mistake that people make when it comes to, to trying to drive efficiencies in their business? Look, I, th- I think documenting some type of what does success look like before you start is ideal. So when we run our – we run – um, traction in our in our business, which is a business coaching tool. Um, and when we set our quarterly rocks, we then say, what does success look like? So we've got a particular rock and then we we need to really well define what what success and done looks like to that particular rock. And I think you you apply it, we can apply that to anything, but we apply it to when we're going, let's reinvent the annual review process or our first meeting process or um, any process that we've got within our business. It's like, well, what does done look like? How do you know yeah. when you've reached there? What what do we want it to look and feel like practically when is it done? And from there, you can work backwards. I think some people dive into changing the process or just tweaking the process without understanding where they're actually going to finish. Yeah. Because finishing is the most important thing. Even if you fit, like finishing to 80% is okay, if you intended to finish at 80%. Yeah. I think there's probably lots of half-written processes that then advisors get themselves distracted doing something else and then it's never implemented because mm-hmm. it's never finished. I agree. Yeah, and it's, it's, that's the only way that one, you know you, you do it and, and processes are something that we keep coming back to on this part mm-hmm. of the, the mm-hmm. podcast. But um, once it's done, then you can review it. You can't review it until it's done. And then that's, that's that Correct. constant reviewing and improvement that, that really compounds the benefits of efficiencies. Like yeah, exactly. So not that we're not there yet, but the vision is that every, every process has like a date on it and then we have a process to review the processes every two years. So at least now, like, this doesn't exist for us at the moment, but in SharePoint, we can date every page, which then gives us a guide to say when every page was created. So then I know when every process is, was documented. And then every every two years, you start with the oldest documents and go, well, they were written two years ago. Are they still relevant? And you just keep working down that list again and updating your processes. I like even we spent so long recording Colonial First State's website and then they invented a new website. And so now, like, all of our processes, all the videos yeah. don't match the website. So now we've, we eventually classic have to go... Go to classic site. Yeah, you got to you got to change to the new. you got to change to the new. But, um, yeah, it's it's those type of things. Everything's constantly changing. Um, so you've got to suck out and work out how you're going to update your processes. For sure. And so if you were going back to the, like, going back to the drawing board and starting from a clean slate, mm. what would you do differently? Um, I think going back 11 years ago, we didn't write down our processes back then. Mm-hmm. We were a bit looser in terms of it was just Paul and I. We knew what we knew and we just got on and got the work done. And so we didn't really, we didn't go through exercises of, of deciding what the process is and then documenting it. Uh, we sort of knew between us what they were and then just it worked alongside one another, him building his spreadsheets and me just going along, right? <laughs> and so we didn't start with the end in mind in terms of documenting the processes, but that's just because we didn't know. You don't know what you don't know. The business we came from didn't have any processes either, and so we just started a business and started following yeah, just patching it together. So, but it's a lot of time investment. Like we have a we have a guy called Tom. Um, or I'll make him watch this now, but it, for the one mention. But he's a uni student who's incredibly intelligent and IT focused. He's he's studying engineering, but he understands IT, and he's he is documenting out. He's in charge of documenting our processes, taking the videos from Cebu, taking the learnings turning it all into a SharePoint page and putting it up there yeah. in the cloud such that we can use it going forward. And he, he'll work two days a, he's, he's worked two days a week for us for nearly a year. Probably he's been doing it six for at least six months now. Um, and we're getting an intern from uh, the US, I think, and that intern is going to help Tom finish the project by Christmas. Okay. So, so the top tip of what you do differently is have the processes sooner. 
Yeah, try to have the processes sooner. Even if, yeah, it, you don't have to document the process, not each step along the way, but actually, yeah, try to document what you're doing. But if you're starting on your own, it's kind of hard because you sort of say to yourself, well, I know what I'm doing, so um, why would I document it? Um, yeah. So my top tip is start with a VA <laughs> on day one. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's if you, what are you trying to do on day one? What, what's your, if you think you've got an investment to start a business and you've got two competing things, you've got um, all of the expenses that you want to pay, so you go, oh, I'll just start it with myself. I would encourage everyone to go, well, it's $20,000-odd a year for a VA. Start on day one with a VA and they will document your processes. Yeah. Yeah, I found myself that I, I flew solo for a year and, like, uh, like you guys, I just just figured it out, mm. sort of do everything on the yep. fly, nothing. I had thought in processes, and I sort of knew what my process was. But it was only when after a year that I've bring Yang into the business, mm. didn't know about financial planning. Mm. Uh, that sort of forced me because she didn't understand and to document everything out so I would mm. make sure that nothing was missed. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, like, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time like, mapping it out with her and mm. uh, using it and figuring out, you know, get the process done and then go, okay, well, because I've got it in my mind to say, well, I think this is how I should think, but not everyone. In fact, very few people think exactly the way that I do. Mm. Yang, definitely not. So uh, she would go, oh, well, that doesn't make sense. Like, that's what's the thing? And then mm. it allows you to go, well, actually, now we can refine. And it was only really mm. then that we started enhancing what we're doing, more consistent customer experiences, mm. better from an efficiency perspective. And like you say, that if you don't have that, then it doesn't force you to, to do it. But that's really the foundation. Mm. I think for any sort of, this, you know, we're talking about scale. That you can't scale without a level of consistency. It's impossible. Yeah. You're yeah. just growing and yeah. just people growing. Mm. Yeah, form. and scaling is that it doesn't – scaling works well when there's mm. something to follow. You can't scale off nothing. It just doesn't – it doesn't work. Yeah. Like that's not scaling. That's working harder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> scaling, scaling by definition has to be that you're able to do things stronger, better, faster yeah. and – you're not you're not necessarily scaling the customer experience. You're scaling the stuff that the clients don't see or value mm. in the back end, right? So you'll sit in front of a client. Doesn't your advice processes might be super efficient, but that doesn't matter when you're sitting in front of the client. They yeah. just care about you and the and the discussion and what you draw on the whiteboard for four hours. That's yeah. what they value. Yeah. And then you go away and you do everything else in the background efficiently, efficiently. Yeah. So they don't even see it. They don't know how many people you got in the back end engine working. It's more. It's no, about. Don't care. Don't they don't ask. Care. They don't. No. They don't. They don't ask, or it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily matter. Um, and we've had good success. Even um, our team in Cebu now email our clients without a problem. Yeah, I had someone ask me the other day. This whole office was for us. They were upstairs. They they came in on the. Oh yeah, yeah. Here and they said, "Is this all?" Like, oh, no. We're just downstairs in the dark. Well, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I guess I have four floors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, mate, that, look, I, I could chat all day. I love efficiency as a, as a topic, and I, I know that we can, we can shoot the But you want this meeting to be efficient. Exactly. So <laughs> start on time, finish on time. That's the goal. <laughs> yeah, it's just clearly on. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I've got some efficiency gains uh, to, to get to have. But uh, before before I let you go, a few quick ones for you. Okay. What's your uh, biggest books moment or stuff up? Doesn't have to be an efficient thing. Just like biggest oh, in work wise. Yeah. Um, you, can, you can lay down some of your personal. Values. Oh, I've got too many. Uh, too many. Too many of those. Um, my biggest stuff up is I once sold some BHP shares for a client that were like pre CGT. And I didn't know uh, that was a bit of a stuff up. She can't undo those kind of things. No. Um, so that costs some of them. We had to compensate the client. Right. So that's it. Um, best piece of advice you ever received? Oh, look, the, the, the best piece of advice is like, the funniest one, but everyone says that you don't know what you don't know. Like that's actually, if you start to think about that, that's why you need help 
all of the time is that clients don't know what they don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And so listening to this podcast or other podcasts and just gaining information is very valuable. And you can't you can't get too much information. Yes. Yeah. Although I wonder though when it comes to clients and they that information overload and um, I find yeah, I suppose it depends on the context, but mm. uh, sometimes that can be a barrier. For clients for clients. Yeah. yeah, for clients. But for us as business owners and trying to think about what our businesses might be like in five years and to think about what other things may take over our roles or our driverless cars or our artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. We don't, you've got to seek out that information to work out whether it's pro, to be at the front end of the industry. And not be reactive, which is a yeah. lot of stuff we're seeing. Mm. I like it. Cool. And uh, last one, and we, we spent a lot of time talking about team, but what would be your top tip for teams? Top tip for the I, I sort of spoke about the top tip for the virtual team in treating treating your team as if they're in your office yep. is absolutely number one. Um, the other thing that we're doing with our team is next Monday, I think, is that we're having every we're all having a meeting and pizza, and so they're getting pizza in Cebu in their meeting room. They're going to sit around like this four four of them on that side eating pizza, and we're going to do the same thing on the other side. So there's a there's a concept. Probably different favors. In the Philippines, they have some random uh, food. So random from us, normal for them. It's like, so um, I think team culture is really important and putting the effort in to maintain the culture, even though you're in two different locations, is really important. So top tip for the team is to make, is to bring your, wherever your team is, is to ensure that you're having that moment of fun built in to your week, month, year. And you know? consistent. And consistent. And you've got to, like, it's, you've got to systematise the fun to, in order to remember Because we've got a lot of stuff going on and it's yeah. like I want to be nice to my team and I want to have, uh, I want to reward and sit down and have a chat with them. But if I don't create a system around Bentley making sure that we book it in every quarter, it just gets forgotten just because I got a lot of stuff on, so even though that it's meant to be fun and spontaneous, it doesn't mean that you don't you, you don't ha- it doesn't have to be spontaneous. Yeah. So right. you can you can set a reminder to buy Yang flowers every month. She doesn't need to know that you okay. set the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got cats and, and there's a lot of allergens in the flowers. So now I save money on flowers. It's good. Buy like cat food instead. Exactly. So yeah, that's my team. That's my. That was a question. Team tip. Top team. Yeah, top team tip. Team. Yeah. Last question. What is your spirit animal? Oh, good. I was ready for this one actually. Yeah. Because I listened to the other couple of podcasts. Brad so, Evans asked me that he didn't know what spirit animal was. Ah, uh, I don't know. Can't can't and comment. So yeah. Um, I think that I I. I and the honest, the, on, the honest answer when I was listening to the first podcast and what absolutely comes to mind is that my spirit animal is actually a penguin. Um, yeah, which I know will be quite random, but the context is in, in, and she reminds relationship, penguins date, penguins mate for life. And so we have this picture. If any, yeah, I know. We've got if I on my wall at home, we've got this picture of two two penguins, and obviously now there's a little penguin in between. But um, yeah, we have our spirit animals in terms of our relationship is is the penguin because that's the uh, the attitude that we have towards our relationship. Do you have a non-narcissistic response? Or- I I did, but I can't remember. I can't remember what it. Is I Jess's um horse? <laughs> no, I'm ha- I'm happy that I close with the um with the the penguin, and you can put it Jess's in. Jess's horse line was good. That was solid. Was yeah, like, yeah, left field. Yeah, it was good. So no, I, I didn't. I don't think I have. I don't think I have another one for myself. Um, you can you can come up with come up with one. Um, Man. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> love the you. Uh, thank you very much for Thanks, joining buddy. us. Appreciate the time. Uh, some great tips there. Yeah, love your work. Yeah.
You're welcome. Thank you. Cool.